That's what she's going to talk about. I haven't met Leo before. Um, I don't know anything about what she's done, so I will be just as interested as you all will in her presentation. consultant. I've worked for library system vendors and now I'm back being a librarian. <laughs> um, and along the way, um, because of that, um, I tend to get involved a lot in our larger scale IT, library IT projects um, because I've got a history of being able to uh, implement um, systems but also the, the change management um, aspects and that are um, so just to give you a little bit of a, a little bit of context, um, Gold Coast um, Library Service is the second largest. Sorry. Okay. Okay. How about I stand in the middle? It's easier. Okay. Is that better? Sorry. So the Gold Coast Public Library Service is the second largest public library service in Australia. Um, mainly that's because of the way that local government areas are structured within Queensland. Uh, so in the other states you don't tend to get the councils that are the same size as a Brisbane or a Gold Coast or a Sunshine Coast. They tend to break them up into um, smaller um, units. We have a distributed network of 12 branch libraries that stretch from Coolangatta on the New South Wales border um, through to Helensvale. We used to have one at Beanley, but with the local government reforms, we didn't have um, an arranged marriage. We had a divorce. So <laughs> we lost Beanley to, um, to Logan. Um, we have two mobile libraries. We have a, a local studies, local history library, a corporate library, um, a collection services unit, our technical services unit, which is based in one of our depots, and a small library administration unit, which is where our corporate library or special library to council is actually um, situated. We have 177 staff, um, an FTE of 149.5, I think it is. Um, plus we also have a, a team of library casuals um, that, that um, come in and support us. We have um, over 250,000 registered members. Um, we serve a population base of um, five and a half million. And once you add visitors into that, the tourists into that, it, it takes it up to um, closer to the high six. Um, 600,000. Um, we have a collection, a physical collection of just over 900,000 items, the majority of which floats between our, our libraries. Um, and we also have a growing collection of um, online and digital um, resources. We transact over 7 million loan transactions per annum. Um, and we have um, over 8,000 visitors a day come to our, come to our library. So we're, we're, we're fairly busy. It's a fairly busy service. It's a, it's a, a well-utilised um, service. Back in 2003, we um, implemented uh, the um, Circe Unicorn library management system, or, and when I say the library management system, as you know, there are, there are this whole suite of products and services that go in that in terms of um, reporting tools and resource discovery layers and various things like that. But our library management system was um, mainly in, implemented at Gold Coast in 2003. Um, and we um, had both production and test environments for that. And it was a mixture of, um, at the time, um, there were probably about uh, four servers 
um, that were involved in that. Um, the uh, LMS server itself, which were Unix-based servers, so test and production versions of that. Um, and then for the OPAC, um, uh, we had uh, Windows SQL servers. And then in 2005, we implemented another part of the system, which was Director Station, a reporting tool, which added another um, server in the mix. And things were going on okay at that point. We had a regular um, uh, upgrade path. We were getting upgrades for the system um, every year. We could choose to take them or not. Um, it was it was it was basically working until um, we missed one upgrade, or we chose not to take one upgrade because there was certain functionality that wasn't working properly that we actually required, and we then encountered um, a bit of a freeze on what was happening with IT projects within council. So um, as, as with a lot of areas, IT services um, within council are, are a shared services arrangement. So um, the IT staff look after the IT across the entire organisation. And with something like a, um, a municipal council, it's a very diverse um, service set and that that um, people are trying to support. So wherever possible, there's as much, there's a lot of emphasis made on making the standard operating environment as standard as possible. With something like a library management system, it's a specialised line of business application. It involves protocols and elements that you don't encounter in other um, parts of the organisation, in the, the services that are being provided. And there's a certain degree of um, a certain tension around the, the fact that with a lot of the council systems, because of the... Um, type of information and that that's being kept corporately, there's that urge to protect and preserve and lock down and keep people out. And with libraries, there's that fundamental thing of wanting to share and open and explore and engage. So um, at various times, that makes it a little bit challenging in terms of managing that environment in that way. But we'd reached a point corporately where there was a lot of activity going on in the IT space, a lot of people trying to get the same resources to do the works, and there'd, um, there was basically a freeze put on new works happening while some prioritisation issues were sorted out. There were other things that happened as well. What that meant is that our upgrade cycle got further and further behind. Until we got to a point in 2008 where the software was three versions behind. Um, the uh, policy with the vendor at that stage was that they would support a new release of the, of the system for two years. Um, uh, so, so they kept they'd support basically two versions: the current version and the previous version for for two years. So we were technically out of full support um, for the system. Now, they were very good. If we if we'd actually had a problem, if there'd been a um, a situation where something gone wrong, they would have been in there to to help us. But what it meant was we weren't getting upgrades, we weren't getting enhancements, we weren't getting patches anymore. We'd we'd reached that, that point where basically we couldn't progress anything with the software we had unless we went through and did an upgrade. Added to that, we had the situation where the servers were overdue for life cycling. So of our five servers that we had running, four um, needed life cycling. Council's preferred path for its Unix services were, were down the HP line. And the, at that stage, it was the HP Itanium platform, which we were advised the LMS wasn't supported on. The recommendations for our size library service, the transaction loads and that that we did, was that we actually go down a, a sun um, path for the, for the servers, which would have been fine, but there wasn't the experience or the skill set within council to really support it. They, they could have done it, but it, it would have been a lot of growing pain in, in terms of doing it, and we would have really had to afford to, to do that. So, our, so we had nowhere to go with our software upgrades. The servers were um, on extended warranty arrangements, 
and it was starting to get expensive. And the system was starting to become a little bit fragile. There were parts of the system that you had to be uh, careful what you were doing and um, it, was, it was subject to data corruption if, if too many things went wrong. So we were becoming increasingly vulnerable. Uh, it wasn't dire. We weren't about to, to die the next day, but there were real risks and real issues around it. And one of the things about, you know, when you've got a popular library service, public library service, it's very visible when things go wrong. Um, so that caused a certain amount of nervousness throughout the, um, throughout the organisation. <coughs> so we reached the... Oh, and the other thing with the upgrade part of the upgrades as well was we also needed to upgrade Oracle um, as part of it. So what should have been a fairly routine, standard process of doing regular upgrades and life cycling then compounded into this project that was then bigger than Ben-Hur in terms of what we were what we were going to do and the change management aspects um, around it. So at, at that stage we said, right, stop, let's look at everything and let's see what our options actually are. The option to do nothing wasn't viable. We, we were past that point. We, we had to move um, beyond that. So that was quite comforting for me. I could rule that out straight away and say, no, we actually have to do something. Um, the... The other option was to go through and do the, the in-house upgrades and replace everything and, and do that. Um, the costs were phenomenal um, to actually do that because of all the elements that were involved. There was also no real guarantee that we weren't going to get into the same bind a few years down the track because we knew um, corporately what was, what was happening was that there were some very large IT projects that were going to be happening across the, the organisation. Um, we were um, go looking at introducing at that, say, GRP, so enterprise um, resource planning, so finance, assets, um, HR, everything um, was, was going to be replaced. There was a, a dedicated effort about uh, reducing the server farm and reducing all the things we were going into virtualization. There was a lot of activity that was actually happening in the corporate IT space. And so, and, and it was all stuff that needed to be done, but that meant that the priority around libraries was of necess necessity going to be less. And so even though we could budget for various work to happen over the over the next term, we had no guarantee that it would actually happen and that we wouldn't end up in the same sort of situation. Um, we could go out to market. We could have gone and said, okay, let's go out and buy something else. At the time, the market was quite volatile. It was when you had a lot of the mergers happening around the um, library system vendors, um, including Cersei itself. You had the Cersei Dynex um, merger. Um, there was a lot of interesting stuff starting to happen around the open source systems but hadn't progressed to a degree where we could stand back and say, yes, this is, this is the proven solution, this is the way we should go. And an organisation such as, as Gold Coast is fairly risk averse. So, you know, we don't tend to go out on the, on the bleeding edge and, and do things a lot. And plus, it, it would have been the same issues. We would have had to have set up, um, you know, it would have bought us some time to throw everything out and start it, start anew. But we still would have needed to get those resources to be able to do that project, and we still would have needed to commit a, to commit around a long-term life cycling upgrade path. Um, there was some interest in looking at a southeast Queensland regional sort of um, support arrangement for the system. Um, it happens that a number of the public library services in South East Queensland were actually all on Unicorn. So, um, and certainly Brisbane. Um, well, so there was some synergies and some interest about do we go that way? Do we set up a regional sort of support model, consortium model and, and look at that? Um, unfortunately, the timing around that was around when the local government reforms, we're on the boundary reforms 
And so everyone's attention was focused very much around that and all of the resources and all the money was around that. There was no space for people to stop back and actually consider um, this sort of approach at, at that time. Um, and because we were a little bit behind where everyone else was, um, it also meant we probably would have had to have done some preliminary upgrades anyway to get to a point where we could have, where we could have considered that. And within the time frame we needed, it just wasn't viable. So we'd been looking for a while at the possibility of hoster-type solutions, and, and um, Cersei Dynex did um, have um, a SAS arrangement um, for the system, and so we decided to investigate it more thoroughly and, and look at that. Um, and when we did, we found that, yes, um, for a number of reasons, it seemed to be the, the preferred way to, for us to go. If we set up a five-year SAS arrangement at that point in time, it would give us um, some, some breathing room and buying room to actually look at where the library systems were going and, and how they were developing so that then we could you know, go out back out to market and look again and see what was happening with open source and those sorts of things. It would allow us to progress um, with the upgrade paths for the, for the system and actually um, there, even within the, the versions that we were behind, there was a lot of functionality in that that was actually in the systems that would have given us enormous um, staff efficiency gains, but also a, a lot of um, the groundwork for what we could do for customer services, um, integration in with social networking, more things coming in with different resource layers and things, greater integration between um, federated searching and, and those sorts of things that we wanted to make available to people and were there and were within the, um, the software, it's just not the three versions behind that, that we had. But more importantly, it would give us a certain degree of um, comfort that there would be a regular upgrade and support cycle. And the costs for that would be known. And we could budget for them and we would know that it would happen. Um, so the arguments were fairly compelling around that and um, we decided that that would be the path that we'd pursue. So in 2009, we went through to um, establish um, transitioning um, the system to a, to a SAS arrangement with Cersei Dynex, um, in the process doing three upgrades and um, almost, it was almost a data migration effort in, in the effort to, um, to do that. Um, there was a lot involved around that. We were actually the first venture in the cloud that the council really took. Um, so ours was the first SaaS solution that they actually um, considered. Um, not long after us, and sort of a little bit in conjunction with us, the, um, the help desk um, software. Originally it was the ICT help desk, but it's actually grown now. Um, they were looking at a SaaS solution for that as well. Um, so there was some thought that together we could actually develop and manufacture the artefacts and all of that for the organisation to have this as a model to go forward for other businesses that were looking, as normally seems to happen in these sorts of things, the help desk stuff sort of went behind a little bit to the to the end and the library stuff came through, so we, we ended up being the, um, uh, the first part of the organisation that actually went that way. Um, so the sort of things that, you know, to get the comfort that our um, organisation wanted, they wanted a proof of concept. They wanted us to, to do some work around a proof of concept model um, first. We actually um, set up an arrangement where we paid Cersei um, Dynex to create an instance for us where we, where we could do a proof of concept. Um, and that was actually very useful. That, that instance then came on to be our, our test environment. Um, but it did mean that we could work our way through the labyrinth of the upgrade steps that we needed to, to do. We knew we needed to actually go through those three upgrades because there were database changes and various other things that had happened under the... It wasn't just, you know, a straight set of new functionality coming on top. The actual data structures had changed in the system 
over the course of those three upgrades. So um, we needed to actually work through how that was how that was going to happen. Um, in terms of the interface, it was it was taking it from um, a, a Windows um, interface to a Java interface. So there were substantial uh, um, changes around how a lot of the um, cataloging functions and various things actually presented. So there was quite a, a change management exercise for the staff. Interestingly, in the end, there wasn't a lot of impact for the customers. It, it was all actually more the, the back end um, stuff at that, at that stage. Um, we hadn't had any experience in setting up contracts that were for managed services. Um, we, we, had, we had a couple around, um, we had established a data centre and, and things like that, so there were some elements we could take from that. But we, we had to get in um, legal advice to actually help us construct the contracts and we spoke to various people like the um, Swift Consortium down in, in Melbourne um, who had been running um, a public library consortium in a SAS environment um, at that stage for about 18 months. So we certainly um, borrowed from them quite, <laughs> quite largely when we were setting it up. But there were obviously things we had to take care of around service levels, um, around expectations of um, um, what outages or that might, might occur, um, the processes around um, change management. So we, um, we are actually an ITIL site, so there are certain obligations in that in terms of um, uh, the notifications and the approval processes that we've got to go through for, um, um, for our, our change. So that was quite an education for the vendor um, in, in terms of managing that. Um, there were privacy issues. So around the time that this was occurring was when some of the work was starting to come through on the information privacy legislation um, within, um, within Queensland, whereas local government were, were, were bound by that. So that meant things like our data couldn't go offshore, for example. And we had to, um, we had various uh, security classifications around our data where anywhere that we were entering a user ID and PIN combination, we needed that to be secured and a number of, of things like that that we had to actually go through and um, establish within our, our contract. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had both production and test environments. Technically, as NITEL, we should also have a training environment as well. We, we didn't go down that way, but we certainly did establish um, um, uh, test and production environments. Um, the whole thing of how we accessed it, there was nervousness about the thought that we were going across the internet, just generally. and you know, what that might mean for um, um, responsiveness to the service, that sort, of, that sort of thing. So initially when it went through that we should be looking at it, there were suggestions that we should have a dedicated line, a dedicated pipe um, for it. And we did some work around that, but it, it was a, a combination of circumstances. It was, it was first of all that um, the data centre where the, where the servers are actually hosted at the time, which was within a, a Telstra um, data centre, was actually a, um, a retail centre, a business centre. And so um, it wasn't actually as straightforward to get a dedicated line in, um, in that environment. And the costs were interesting as to what it was going to be. And so then it was, then it was a case of, um, weighing up the risk and really is, is that required for, for what we were doing. And in the end we went um, with a secured VPN um, link through. Um, we were going at the same time through our disaster recovery strategies across council for our various business systems. So at the same time we also established a, um, 
a backup VPN link for our SaaS solution. So this is this is an example where libraries pay the you know pay for the way, actually pay for the infrastructure <laughs> um, for this to happen um, corporately. And subsequently, there are some other services that have that have come on. But so we we had to iron all that sort of stuff out and and go through that. Um, The upgrade, um, the upgrade happened. Um, the and it happened around the time of the Gold Coast show because this gave us some some good opportunities because we were going through these three upgrades. The the whole process of taking the data across and doing it in a production environment meant that we did have to have an outage of. Um, uh, just over two days to, to really do it. Um, so we managed to get permission to close early on Thursday nights because Thursday nights are our late nights. We had Friday as the public holiday for the show day. Um, we closed Saturday and then we, we have two libraries that operate on a Sunday. They just happen to be our two busiest libraries. But they operate on a Sunday. So we decided that we, we would do that. We would have that period where we would close the Friday and the Saturday and the upgrades would happen and we would open with it on, um, on the um, uh, Sunday at Rabina and Southport. And we had, we had various Cersei Dynex people on site, you know, to, to sort of be observing what was happening. And I don't know if you've actually been to any of our libraries after a large public holiday or something like that, but because we'd had this, this closure for this period of time, it was quite literally like the Boxing Day sales. <laughs> People queued up at the doors just waiting to come in. And we the, the vendors had sort of start. we tried to warn them, but we we started to give them an idea of what it might be like when they first arrived by opening the door to the after hours return shoot at Southport where we decided we, you know, we needed to take the bins out and all of that and it was quite literally the room was half full of books so you open the door and everything just sort of tumbled out. So there were various photos that floated around the web where the Cersei guys went, oh, look at this, look at this. But then this whole thing of, you know, <laughs> five minutes before opening, I was at Southport my manager was at Rabina, which was the other library where it was. And suddenly the, the, the call came through from Rabina. We just need to do a quick halt and run before we do it. And I'm going, what? <laughs> we have to do what? <laughs> um, so normal, normal sorts of things that happen around these projects. It was a little bit tense um, on the go live, but went through. And, yeah, there were, there were some... Um, some things that needed to catch up. One of the things that had needed to catch up, for example, was that we have a, a digitised um, image collection called Picture Gold Coast, which actually um, we contribute those items to, to Trove, um, to, or Picture Australia as it was then. And um, uh, the, the linkages of the URLs hadn't quite, hadn't quite gone across properly, so we had some of those, um, those sorts of issues. But we got through, and from that point on, it just started running and operating. We've had a few outages um, since uh, since then. The n most notable one where, was where Optus cut the internet cable into South East Queensland. Um, in, this, in the frame of things, the libraries weren't the biggest priority there <laughs> in terms of getting that one, that one fixed. But, you know, OK, that was, that was something that happened. Most of the outages we've had have been we've been working on our firewalls. We've been doing something. It's been more at our end. We have had a couple of outages that have happened around where the um, um, uh, something went wrong in the servers at the Cersei end. We had one this Easter for example, but the number of times that that's occurred, I can count on one hand in the five years that we've doing. We have had some scheduled, you know, round upgrades and that scheduled outages. What we've been able to do um, since then is we did our... Um, 
So we went over in 2009. In 2010, we upgraded Symphony, we upgraded Director Station, we installed Web Report, a book mine, library thing for libraries and various um, other discovery layers over the top. In 2011, we migrated Hyperion to Portfolio, um, installed an enterprise discovery layer over the top, upgraded to Symphony 3.4, this year we're going to go through and do a major upgrade to the OPAC. We've got another upgrade to, to the library management system. Just the, the fact that we're able to progress those things, and it's still not completely straightforward. We still can't go in and just do anything when we want to do it. We've, we've got to, um, to go through the processes. But we know that work's happening and it's upgrading and it's and it's behind the, um, you know, it just happens. We've had automatically had upgrades done to RAMs, to servers, to, to various things. That capacity of the infrastructure is looked after and managed for us. Um, we get calls in advance if there's something, look, we, we can see this is happening, we think we need to increase this, we need to, to do that. Um, we're coming up to the stage where in next this next financial year coming up, we've got money to go out and look at our options and look at the monies because we're coming to the end of our five-year arrangement. So we will. We'll go out to market and assess what our options are um, and then make the decision as to whether we renew the contract again for longer or we go out for another alternative. But even if we do go out for another alternative, we'd still consider going down this path of, of this solution. Um, if for nothing else, for the peace of mind, and the fact that it works. Um, it's, it's worked for us really well. It has meant um, a change in culture, a change in shift. We can go into our test environment. We have full administrative accesses behind it. We can do halt and runs. We can upload files, download files, get in the back and do things. We can't do that on the production environment. Um, so we, we do our, if we're doing um, parameter changes, configuration changes, we do them on the test environment, then Cersei upload them. Um, we do work around configuration of some of the up, uh, OPAC accesses and then the files are uploaded. So yes, that requires a little bit of planning, um, but at the same time if there's something that's really urgent that, that has to be done there and then it's done, we, we manage that. Um, so. It's been an incredibly positive experience for us. Question? I won't. Just, just a little token for